Hello, welcome and kumusta. Thank you for joining me. This is how your occupational therapist and welcome to occupational therapy conversations. In this episode, I'd like to talk to you about cognitive assessments and my experience when it comes to cognitive assessments. In fact, I'll talk to you about something interesting, possibly the business of these standardized tools. Yes, this is an exciting topic, guys. The business of using standardized tools or the business of cognitive assessments. Over the years, I've had lots of practice and came across with a lot of cognitive assessments. And it is a thing. There are tools out there that are standardized. And when it is standardized, what do you mean by that? It meant that there is a set procedure that you can do or that you needed to do. That's a standardized way. And there is this validity, which means uh, does it answer or does it resolve or address the things that it needed to assess? And then there is this aspect of reliability, meaning if one clinician did it, will another clinician do something similar? So these are the three parameters on how standardized tools are actually assessed and measured. And from an occupational therapist's perspective, and from my experience anyway, I have seen a lot of standardized tools and have used it a lot in practice. Mind you, an occupational therapist is usually interested in cognitive assessments and cognition. So if I have to bank on some of my experience again, what I have noticed is that therapists would want to learn about neuroassessment, cognitive assessments, and cognition, cognitive rehab, hands. These are the very popular areas of practice for occupational therapists. Very seldom I would have come across with people who has interest in rheumatology or orthopedics, It is by chance that you would encounter them when you're working in the hospital. But really, a good point of interest is neurology, cognition, cognitive retraining. It's just a wonderful thing. And this is occupational therapists almost taking a good role of the psychology, taking some of the sciences coming from psychology. And we wanted to be able to analyze how a person is thinking, how a person is behaving. So cognition came in to play. Back in the days, the very popular cognitive assessment was Falstein MMSE, which would have been the mini mental state examination. And what's good about it is that it quantifies a person's cognitive abilities with into mild, moderate, and severe impairment and that was very popular because it was free and then after that when i went to united kingdom that's when i encountered the ace the addenbrooks cognitive evaluation and there's a lot of movement with cognitive evaluation it remains to be free to date if i am not mistaken and then there was a point where, yes, I have used the Rivermead Behavioral Memory Test or Rivermead Behavioral Inattention Test. There are some American cognitive assessments like Cognitive Assessment of Minnesota, which would have been so nice as well. And there are some spiral maze that somebody has to puzzle and problem solve. At the time, around the 90s, before the dawn of few cognitive assessments, there is this LOTCA, lowest time cognitive assessment, LOTCA. And this is the one that claims that you can use it for somebody with dysphasia or aphasia. So there's methods on how you can do that. And then the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA came about and it was for free. And there comes a point when these cognitive assessments are actually free at first, and it will gain some popularity. And when it is something new, a lot of people flock into using this. 
and then a lot of people will try and use this as a cognitive assessment or a measure of cognition and correlate it with function and that's it really and then after a period of time when a lot of people have been using it whoever the owner was or whoever the owner is of those cognitive assessments would then start to charge for it you need to have a license you need to have a training for these things so that is one technique that people are doing and this happened with Holstein MMSE. You have some drawing in there. You have some things that you needed to remember. There were even some notepads that were giving out, given out for free back in the days. And then they just decided whoever the author was sold it to a company. And I don't know which company would it be, which would have been managing all of these cognitive assessments. So people have developed cognitive assessments. They make the procedure for it. And there are companies that buys these things and now manages it in terms of its publication. And so if you want it, then you need to buy it. So there came a point where the was now subjected into copyright uh, and patent and ownership situation to a point where the Addenbrooke's cognitive evaluation had to be revised because there were some sections of the Addenbrooke's cognitive evaluation that was an adaptation from the Falstein MMSE. Hence, the ACE R came about or the Addenbrooke's cognitive evaluation revised or the ACE 3, the third version of that. And then the beautiful world of Montreal Cognitive Assessment came about as well, which is good. One page, you sign it, that's good. It is 1 to 30, very simple to do. And the cutoff the score would be 26. That's that. And sometime around good 5, 6, 7 years or so ago, or even 10 years now, I have come across with this Oxford Cognitive Screen. So it's another one that is coming out and it's being used and it's again another one of those cognitive assessments that's out there there is test your memory or tim there is o log orientation log there's a lot of things really one thing i'd like to say about these cognitive assessments they are basically and technically the same and similar because they are assessing similar components of cognition. These cognitive assessments have different looks on them, but it will always have the same parameters on which it assesses cognition. And what are these parameters? The parameters of orientation. So you can ask a person about orientation, where they are, where they live, What's the date? What's the name of the place? What's the month? Orientation test. There will be a parameter of attention, an assessment of attention. And what are the most common attention tests that's out there? And it's been around since the 60s and 50s, Stroop test, all of these psychological tests that are out there. What are these attention tests? Reverse spelling, for example, spell an item backwards. D-L-O-R-W, so that's one. Or reverse digit span or serial subtraction. So these are some of the things that you needed to do. Or you would be testing for vigilance, on which case you will have to pinpoint a, an item that's been mentioned. If you hear A, I need you to tap F, B, A, S, D, A, K, D, A, things like that. And yes, it's a test of attention. So what was test? Orientation. You have attention. The other thing would be registration or immediate recall. This is something that people are doing as well. And when you do that, immediate recall would mean they will ask you to say some, read something, and then the, the patient will be repeating what they have heard. And that is an immediate recall where they repeat it and there is registration. So you're able to note it, yes or no. There will be a test of visual perceptual skills. 
And this is again, scanning tasks, identification, sorting tasks, matching tasks, things like that. And there are various approaches or various tests on how you can do that. You can draw a clock, you can draw a flower, you can draw a box, you can complete a picture, for example. These are all standardized tests that's been around for a long time, okay? You can even draw a person because that will give you a test for body image. The other thing is a test for language, meaning the person will be asked to produce as many words that they can think of that begins in one particular letter. So that's one. Or they would test a language in which case a person you would as an examiner will be testing or assessing or describing an item and then the person will have to describe them and then what else abstract thinking that's one that is seldom assessed and but this would be again on the categorization aspect for example you would have categorizing whether like apple orange and pear they're both they're all of them are all fruit, banana, or it's a gem, diamond, ruby, diamond, and what else? Sapphire, they're all precious stones, things like that. It's a test for generalization or abstract thinking. Or you can have proverb tests, okay? So all of the things are there. Oh, obviously, delayed recall, yeah? after you asking them to repeat one thing you would ask the person to repeat it after several minutes of testing and then you ask them to find out like in the river Mead behavioral memory test you ask the patient to identify a few things after the test you ask them to i to identify where they are or you ask a person to to find out an item that you will hide at the beginning so these are all standardized tests with all of these standardized tests it looks so nice. It looks so fresh. It is all the same. So don't get trapped into going with the fad or doing one because not one is better than the other. They're the same. It's all about familiarity. It's all about how you are going to use it. It's all about how you would utilize it in practice. That's one. Yeah, so you may be using the top of the range, the most updated cognitive assessment scores and tools. For example, the Oxford thing, you might consider using that because that's quite fresh in the world of stroke. You might use that. That's good. But once you discharge a person, how does it help the receiving clinician when they don't know anything about it? Have you thought about that? The sustainability. It is something that is not used elsewhere. And what you've done is a test that stops in your service and in your service alone. So when you're doing all of these assessments and these companies, you can make them guys, you can make your own cognitive tests and you can make your own rule and it'll become standardized. Go through the process, standardize it, validate it. And how do you validate a test? You do it with one and you compare it with one that is known. And if there is a correlation between the two and therefore it is validated, that is the uh, criterion reference or content validity. I can't remember the actual practical term. And then the next thing would be do the interator reliability. You can do that. Send it out for free. A lot of people will use it. If a lot of people used it, then that's the opportunity when these things can then be converted into something that is protected and then you cannot use it anymore. You need to get a license. This is the business of it. So this is the business. It's just like the business of house building. It's all the same. It's made of bricks and mortar and nails and wood. It's all the same, but they'll package it differently depending on how it is designed. But it does the same thing. It houses a person. Do you get my analogy? There you go, guys. So this is cognitive assessment and the wonderful world of it. At the end of it, it is assessing all these basic and simple components of the mind, which would be part of the cognitive, cognitive components. So if you're an occupational therapist, 
And if you want to look at performance components, you look at cognition, it will be broken down. It is these things. It makes you feel you're doing something special and something unique if you're doing something that is updated and something new. But in fact, it's the confidence of how you do it. How do you want to analyze it? Okay, I'm just setting you free, guys. I'm setting you free of the trap. I'm not saying you shouldn't use a standardized tool. Go, use a standardized tool because it makes your assessment consistent. But what you shouldn't do is you shouldn't bombard people with standardized tools making other colleagues feel bad for not knowing the updated tools when it's all the same. So you've done these tests, right? So you have exerted a lot of time and effort and learning how to do those tests and you have done those tests. Mind you, this is only one third, if not one half of the game when it comes to doing rehabilitation. Why do I say that? Because all of these tests are only part of the first phase, which is evaluation and assessment. All you're doing is establish a state. All you're doing as a therapist when you're using these tests is to identify a problem. You're doing an assessment. So you've identified the problem. That's one. If you're in the hospital, and you are not doing anything about those problems and you do those tests again, all you're doing is monitoring the state. Are you intervening? Probably not because you're not doing anything. If you spend time doing some interventions like visual perceptual activities, problem solving tasks, assembly tasks, all those visual perceptual activities that you are using doing a visual perceptual frame of reference, then you are doing some treatment to address performance components. And when you're doing these are only enabling activities. Do you remember the stages? Adjunctive activities, enabling activities, purposeful activities, and then community reintegration. So you're still on the enabling activities. Does it translate to the functional task? What you want is for the person to translate things to the functional tasks. And that would be the measure of success. Because what you would do next is you'd have to use the same test to see if there is really a progress. And sometimes there is a mismatch between a person's performance with cognitive assessments and their actual abilities to do day-to-day -day stuff. For example, people who has... Uh, uh, learning disability or those who have dementia, for example, and those people who under geriatric cases and conditions, general public in particular, people are working on rote memory. People are performing based on muscle memory, based on routines, based on habits. And yet those tests are meaningless. They do not translate into something else. Unless you can use these tests if you want to screen out the person in terms of their admission, like for example, entrance exams, or you do some tests before you get them, you, before you employ them. But then these are the parameters and this would be the role of a psychologist and in some of my experience in other countries, this would have been the human resource personnel where they would be screening out performances of staff. But in the United Kingdom, we don't do that. That's a different scenario. Psychological tests would be a battery of tests and a battery meaning there are different components. There will be psychological, there, there will be some cognitive processing, logical testing, speech tests. Uh, visual perceptual tests, a battery of tests. At the end of it, there you go. We are trying to be proud about the things that we know or we update ourselves with some of the tests that we want to learn or we update ourselves with some of the cognitive tests that are available, that are popular. But then in the end, there is a problem with sustainability 
it will not tell that the person will be safe and independent with their personal care. That's why when you're setting goals, it's always difficult to guarantee an improvement on the performance component side of things. It's always better to establish goals, particularly with independence, with safety and the quality of performance. This is now the application of things. When you're applying things in practice, cognitive assessments, yes, they're there. It's good, something that can, you can use, but you still will have to do the hard thing of intervention and treatment because the test and doing the test alone is just the first part of it. It just meant nothing. If you do it over and over again, perhaps it would appear like you're doing some intervention, but then the person would learn how to do the test. That's why they have different versions so that people will not learn the test out of rote and out of habit, out of familiarity. So that is cognitive assessment. That's my talk and conversation involving the cognitive assessment and the business of that. It's interesting. It's a bit controversial. It is a random information, rollicking information involving occupational therapy, which makes this OT conversation a riot conversation. Okay, guys, I hope you learned a little something. If not, I hope you got inspired. If you learned something, talk to your friends, talk about it, have this discussion, have this philosophical debate, grow together, learn together, pass on the knowledge and the information, advocate for occupational therapy, advocate for your patients. Just remember, anything you do matters and has an outcome. Until next time, bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, talk to your friends and colleagues about it. Like it, subscribe, share, and do what you can to appease whatever algorithm that is at play. Just remember guys, anything you do matters and has an outcome. Until next time, bye!